Her research showed that individuals who had a higher MindDive score, meaning that they followed the MindDive closely, had a slower rate of cognitive decline equivalent to seven and a half years um, of younger age. So what that means is, if you are 70 years young, then your cognitive abilities could be about a 62 year old. Doesn't that sound amazing? Yeah, I think, I think so as well. Sign me up. Additionally, those individuals who followed the MIND diet rigorously lowered the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 53%. 53%. And those participants who followed the diet moderately well decreased the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 35%. So this shows that you don't need to follow this diet meticulously. You will still reap the benefits even if you apply some of the concepts. Lastly, her research showed that the longer a person followed the mind diet, the more they were able to lower the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So it's not a one-month one diet, it's a lifestyle change, right? It has to be sustainable. So the mind diet protects the brain by decreasing oxidative stress and inflammation. The Framington Heart Study, which included over 2,000 participants, found that the higher my diet scores were associated with better cognitive function, better memory, and larger total brain volume. So what does the mind diet entail? It has 15 components to it. 10 brain healthy food groups and five less healthy food groups. It's plant-based but not vegan or vegetarian. It's low in foods that are high in saturated fat or what we call bad fats. And it encourages consumption of brain healthy foods such as leafy greens and berries. So let's take a look at your mind diet score. Everyone should have a screening form. So we're gonna complete that as you go along if you haven't already completed it. And don't worry, we're, you're not gonna have to share that information with anyone. It's just purely for you to know. So that's what it looks like. I apologize, it's blurry on the screen, but you should have a copy in front of you. So on the left, you'll see the mind eye components, and you will also see that it has a serving amount and a frequency. So if you consume, so I guess the first one there, for example, is whole grains. Four or three times per day, and a serving would be one slice of bread or half a cup of brown rice, quinoa. So if you have that three times a day, then you give yourself one point. All right, so let's first look at the 10 brain healthy food groups. So we've got whole grains, leafy greens, other vegetables, berries, fish, poultry, beans, nuts, olive oil, and wine. I know, I heard that too. <laughs> if it's less than what's indicated there, you need to zero. Alright, so our first brain healthy food group is whole grains. And as I mentioned, it's recommended to have three servings daily. And what does one serving mean? So one serving is one slice of whole wheat bread, if you're talking about bread. Or if you're looking at cooked grains, half a cup of cooked grains. So whether it's brown rice, whole wheat pasta, oatmeal, spelt, kasha, buckwheat, um, anything like that would count. So three per day. So if you consume whole grains in that frequency or number of servings, give yourself a point on the mind diet score sheet. Now these foods are typically high in B vitamins, magnesium, selenium, folate, and fiber, which are all important for brain health. So let's look at some practical strategies to increase that number if you're um, not getting enough. So in the first picture there is we have quinoa salad. Um, you can also do brown or wild rice would count. And I personally love my rice cooker. It makes cooking rice super easy. You just put the rice in the water and you let it cook. You don't have to stand there stirring it. And then once it's cooked, it just keeps it warm. <laughs> Um, we also have whole grain toast, oatmeal, and that can be overnight oatmeal. Um, 
kasha, barley, you can put that in a soup or a pilaf. All right, our next one is green leafy vegetables. So typically people first think of spinach and kale, but there's so many other ones. We've got Swiss chard, um, green, uh, beet greens, collard greens, rapini, arugula, romaine lettuce, leaf lettuce, all would count. And you want to consume one serving daily. And a serving here, it could be one cup uh, raw or half a cup cooked. And the reason for the difference in serving size is if anyone has ever cooked leafy greens, you realize how soon and quickly they really go down in uh, volume. So that's the reason there. So if you consume leafy greens daily, give yourself a point. And these foods are protective because they're a good source of folate, vitamin E, carotenoids, flavonoids, which are all nutrients that have been associated with lower risk of dementia and cognitive decline. So you might be saying that, well, I don't really like spinach, or maybe it spoils before you're able to consume it. So some people already gave us some wonderful ideas, and hopefully I'm able to provide you with a little bit more. So obviously salads are a great way to include more greens, but you can also add them to your smoothie, as was mentioned, or omelets. If you find that greens spoil quickly, you might want to try frozen greens, and I really like the President's Choice ones. I don't get any kickbacks from it. Um, I just like their brand because it's chopped, it's not in a, one big block, so then it's really easy to put it in a smoothie or a stir fry or a soup or a stew, and then it's also resealable, so then you can take however much you want, reseal it, and put it back in the freezer. So if you see that your fresh greens are about to spoil, you can saute them with a little bit of olive oil and garlic for a nice side dish. Or, I think as someone already mentioned, you can also make little pucks or green cubes as I call them, putting your spinach or your greens in a blender with a little bit of water, blend it up, and then freeze them in an ice cube tray. Then after, when they're frozen, you can just um, put them in a Ziploc bag and then take that ice cube, put it in your smoothie, or put it in your soup or your stew, and it's quick and easy. You can even add spinach or greens to baked goods. There's lots of recipes online um, making green muffins, which are super fun for St. Patrick's Day or even Halloween if you're cooking with your grandkids. And in the top right hand corner, there's also kale chips, which make for a great crunchy snack. If you shop at No Frills, Independent, or Zares, I would suggest um, doing the PC points and downloading their app because oftentimes you have member pricing and so that PC spinach or kale as I mentioned will often be $1.99 instead of $4.99. So that's a good money saving tip. And again, I don't get any kickbacks from PC. <laughs> I wish I did. All right, so our next component is other vegetables. So this is everything except for the leafy greens. These you want to consume at least half a cup a serving daily, but obviously the more the better. And I always try to encourage my patients to think different colors when it comes to fruits and vegetables, because different colors mean a variety of different antioxidants, and, antioxid and antioxidants are going to help to decrease that oxidative stress. So think of yellow, red, orange, white, purple, blue. So if you have half a cup of other vegetables every day, give yourself a point on the screening form. Um, is there a piece of zucchini is not on that list? No, I, I can't have a... <laughs> I couldn't put every single vegetable on there. So another cost-saving tip, and most, some of you might be familiar with this already, um, but we also have the Good Food Box program. And so this is a fantastic program that is open to everybody. Um, it's a group buy program for fresh produce. 
And if you're interested, um, Jackie Taylor, her contact information is on there. She's the coordinator for the program. Each one of those baskets is, about, is $20. And it is every, or first Thursday of the month between noon to three, if you come to the Southeast Bay Community Health Center to pick it up. Make sure you bring bags with you because you can't take the boxes. And the produce is really good quality, and the photo gives you an idea of what's included in the box. But each month it would change a little bit. If you find that the box is too much for you, you can always share it with a friend or a neighbor, or you can inquire about half boxes. So some other helpful resources. Um, the website Half Your Plate, where a lot of the resources came from today that are laying at the front here. Um, how to waste less fruits and vegetables. Um, I really like the shelf life guide because sometimes when you get the good food box, there might be some vegetables or fruits you might not be familiar with. And so it kind of gives you an idea of how long it's going to last, right? So that way you can eat the fruits and vegetables that are going to spoil quickly first and then leave the others for a later day. It also talks about how to store fruits and vegetables properly, if they should be stored in the fridge, or the freezer, or um, the pantry, or countertop. There's a seasonal guide, and some ways to preserve your summer produce. The second website there, Produce for a Better Health Foundation, if there's a vegetable that you are wanting to try but you're not familiar with, you go on their database, type in their vegetable, and it will give you information on how to select it, um, some nutritional information, how to store it properly, and obviously some recipes so that you give it a try. And hopefully, um, love it. So some ideas how to incorporate vegetables into the diet. So frozen vegetables are just as good as fresh, especially in the winter time when the fresh vegetables are so expensive. With frozen vegetables, I encourage you to look for vegetable mixes that have at least three different colors, right? Because we want to get different colored antioxidants. So for example, the first one there is three pepper and onion blend. So we've got greens, white, yellow, and red, or the California mix. So that's broccoli, cauliflower, and carrots. I also have a picture there of the butternut squash because I know sometimes cutting and chopping and peeling a squash is a workout in itself, and I'm not really interested in that. <laughs> so this, it's quick and easy. It's diced. Again, it's resealable. So if you're making butternut squash soup, you just pour that into a pot, and it's easy peasy. There's also pickled vegetables on there. So we've got pickled beets, peas, roasted red peppers, artichoke hearts. These are still very nutritious. Yes, they have a little bit more salt in them, but most times you can find lower salt alternatives. I also have a picture of cabbage on there. Cabbage is one of the least expensive vegetables and you get a whole whack of cabbage in one head. And it's very versatile. You can grate it or shred it to put onto a salad. You can make um, cabbage steaks. You can pickle it. You can make coleslaw. And the other benefit is with purple cabbage. Sometimes purple is a hard color to get. Um, so purple cabbage also gives you that antioxidant anticyanin, which is very, very nutritious. Some other strategies using zucchini instead of lasagna noodles, or spiralizing vegetables such as zucchini or carrots instead of having pasta maybe, or spaghetti squash, another fun one to try. So our next food group is berries. For berries, it's recommended to have two or more servings per week. And one serving is half a cup. And again, frozen is just as good as fresh. And when it's on sale and you've got the freezer room, you can stock up. Berries like strawberries and blueberries have shown to decrease neuron loss and improve memory performance. 
Wild blueberries are typically darker and much smaller in size than cultivated ones. And if you can afford it, that's fantastic. Wild blueberries actually have double the antioxidant content, again, that anthocyanin that we saw in purple cabbage. This is because the majority of the antioxidant is located in the skin. And since the wild blueberries are smaller in size, it takes about roughly twice the amount of wild blueberries to fill the cup. So if you're consuming two half cup servings a week of berries, give yourself a point. So some practical suggestions to include berries. You can add them to your cottage cheese or top your oatmeal. Or my personal favorite, dip them in Greek yogurt and freeze them. That's a really sweet, yummy snack. Or you can freeze it uh, and make popsicles. You can make chia jam, which is really delicious and nutritious. <coughs> Have a yogurt parfait. And I'm sure there's many others that you can think of. So the next component is fish. And the recommendation there is one or more servings per week where one serving is three ounces. So if you consume three ounces of fish every week, give yourself a point. A healthy brain is approximately 60% fat. 60% fat. Yes, we need fat. <laughs> and omega-3s, especially DHA, is concentrated in the brain tissue. Studies show that higher intakes of DHA is thought to slow brain aging and improve memory. This is why oily fish is recommended, such as salmon, sardines, herring, trout, and mackerel. Now, some of you might be thinking, but I thought fish was bad for you because it's high mercury. Well, and you would be partly correct. In the ocean, mercury is converted to monomethyl mercury or simply methylmercury, which is a neurotoxin, meaning a toxin for your brain. Methylmercury moves up the food chain and becomes highly concentrated in predatory fish. These large predatory fish include shark, swordfish, fresher frozen tuna, orange roughy. I really like this graphic. It can be downloaded from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency website. It shows you the best choices to consume, which are also low in mercury, and fish to avoid because they're high in mercury. And I've outlined, I've outlined um, fishes in red that are high in omega-3. So as you can see, all of the high omega-3 fish are also on the best choice list. And that's anchovy, Atlantic mackerel, herring, um, Pacific chub mackerel, salmon, sardines, smelt, and trout. I also want to bring your attention to tuna. Tuna is not an oily fish, so it has limited amounts of omega-3. In terms of mercury content, tuna used for canned tuna is usually younger and smaller and therefore has significantly less mercury than fresh or frozen. The mercury content does change with the type of tuna canned, and there's typically two different types. So light can also be labeled as skipjack or yellow fin, is younger and smaller and therefore lower in mercury. The other one called albacore or white tuna is higher in mercury. So it's under the good choices, not best choices. As you can see, the recommendation from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency website is to consume two to three palm size servings from the best choices weekly. I would encourage you to take one step further and make sure that those fish are high in omega-3, which again are outlined in red. So now that we know what fish is recommended and how much to consume, let's look at what, how to incorporate fish into our diet. So some of us are not fish people, and that's okay, but sometimes we think of fish as a filet and nothing else. 
So I wanted to show you that salmon in particular comes in many different forms. So we've got canned salmon, just as good as fresh, just a little bit higher in salt. Depends on the brand. Some of them are quite low in salt. Some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm not going to do canned. It has bones and skin, and that doesn't work for me. Well, luckily, food manufacturers now make a boneless, skinless canned salmon. So it's more like tuna, but with extra omega-3s. There's also sushi. Obviously, your salmon filet. Um, on the left there, that salmon jerky, which is really convenient if you're skiing or hiking to have with you. Although, again, keep in mind it's a bit higher in salt. There is smoked salmon. And the picture bottom right, that's my personal favorite. So it's canned salmon or tuna. I typically do salmon. Mix it with some avocado instead of mayo. Add whatever seasonings you like to it. And it's a really nice dip. You can have it with whole grain crackers or vegetables. Really, really yummy. And it's super easy. So if you're watching your grocery bill or your budget, then maybe try an inexpensive fish like sardines or herring would be a better option. These cans of fish are typically under $2 and extremely nutritious. And they're ready to eat, so you don't have to prepare anything. So what can you do with it? Well, since it's ready to eat, you can have it on top of a salad or add to a pasta salad. Or sardines also come in a variety of flavors. So if you like sardines, I encourage you to stick with those that are packed in water or lemon, as those are the lower salt options. When you're looking at um, those packed in tomato sauce or hot sauce, they typically are quite high in salt. And you can have them on a cracker or on a slice of toast. Or you can put it in a blender with some garlic and seasoning and make a spread out of it. For herring, you can find it canned beside the tuna in a variety of flavors, just like the sardines. And again, having it packed in water or lemon pepper would be the better options for low salt. But you can also find it in the refrigerated section pickled with onion. And that would be a great choice too, but keep in mind a little bit higher in salt. All right, moving on to our next food group, poultry. So for poultry, it's recommended at least two servings per week. And unfortunately, this does not include fried chicken. <laughs> One serving is three ounces, or about the size of your palm. And eating more poultry, so chicken and turkey, than, and less red meat is associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. Our next one is legumes. So legumes include beans and lentils. And these foods are nutritional powerhouses as they're high in fiber, protein, magnesium, potassium. It's recommended to consume half a cup serving three to four times a week. If you're doing this, give yourself a point. So I know the cost of groceries is on everyone's mind, so I wanted to show you this. So 900 gram of beans, dry beans, or lentils, is under $3. So beans typically double in volume when they're cooked. So for that 900 gram of beans, I can get 26 and a half portions of cooked beans. So that means each half a cup serving is 12 cents. Really cheap. Now, if you don't have time to soak the beans, we can look at canned beans. They're a little bit more expensive, but still fairly reasonable. So 540 gram can of beans will give you four and a half servings, and that will give you 27 cents per serving. Again, quite reasonable if you don't have to soak the beans. So the difference between beans and lentils, beans, they typically need to be soaked overnight, or now we've got a new hack for that. 
or if you have an Instapot, um, I love mine. It's 40 minutes in the Instapot, you don't need to do any pre-soaking, and we're cooked. Lentils, on the other hand, don't need to be pre-soaked, and they cook much faster. Depending on the variety, they're done in 15 to 25 minutes. So once your beans are cooked, or you have a, a can of canned beans, what can you do with them? Well, I think typically we think of chili, which is very yummy and delicious, but you can also add beans to salads, soups, stews, pasta sauces. We can make bean salads, bean salsa, bean dips like hummus or black bean dip. Uh, <clears throat> we can add beans to pasta salads or wraps or pitas. You can try making your own roasted chickpeas which are great by themselves, or you can sprinkle it on a salad for a little bit of crunch. Some other ideas. So we talked about canned beans. They're super convenient because all you have to do is open the can, drain, rinse, and the beans are ready to go. Um, the second picture from the left there, you see a six bean medley. So again, that's a really easy to make a quick bean salad. So open the can, rinse, drain, and add your favorite salad dressing. Red lentils are pretty neutral in flavor, and they're super quick to cook. You can cook them, blend, and freeze them in the ice cube tray. And then again, take those lentil cubes, put them in a Ziploc bag, and then they're ready to go for when you can add them to a soup, or a pasta sauce, or a stew, and no one's even going to notice. The next photo there is a lentil tortilla. It's really easy to make. Two ingredients, lentils and water, blend it in the blender, and then you've got your batter for the lentil tortilla. Now, that sounds pretty bland, but you're welcome to add other seasonings and flavorings, right? You can make it more sweet by adding cinnamon, maybe, or more savory by adding oregano or any other spice. So, next photo there, it's a picture of chickpea ice cream. I know, some of you may be turning up your nose, but don't, you gotta try it first. No. So what that includes is chickpeas, pitted dates for sweetness, peanut butter, vanilla extract, and milk. Blend and freeze, super easy. Remember how you can purchase beans and lentils dry? and how it's really cost effective. Well, once you cook them, I suggest freezing them in one cup portions so that it's ready to go when you need it. So the next one is green and yellow split peas, rice, pearl barley, and red lentil soup mix. Okay, this is again $3, and the recipes aren't there. Um, it's just oil, a can of diced tomatoes, onions, and let me see, I think that's pretty much it. And it cooks in 60 minutes. And it makes whole bunch and super mind-friendly meal. The next photo is a photo of chickpea, no-bake energy balls. So what that includes is chickpeas, peanut butter, honey, vanilla extract, and oat flour. Put everything in the blender, roll it into little balls, and it's ready to go. And last but not least is dessert hummus. So chickpeas, cocoa powder, maple syrup, vanilla extract. Delicious, and if we pair it with some strawberries, again, a really great mind diet healthy snack. <coughs> some other ideas. Roasted beans and lentils are great as a snack by themselves, and they come in a variety of different flavors. They can be added to salads for some crunch and nutrition. And the next row are pastas, which are made from lentils and different beans, such as chickpeas or black beans. These pastas are very high in protein and fiber, so it would be a great vegetarian option. However, these items are pricey. If you're watching your grocery budget, then stick with the dried lentils and beans to make your dollar go further. Okay, our next component is nuts. 
One, one quarter cup of nuts daily is recommended. And if you're doing that, give yourself a point. Preferably, you want to choose unsalted nuts. And walnuts are king when it comes to brain health. And that's because they're really high in plant-based omega-3. All right, some practical ideas. So mix nut butters into your hot cereal for a nice nutty flavor. Add nuts to your no-bake energy balls. My personal favorite, drizzle nut butters on pancakes instead of maple syrup as a way to also decrease the sugar. When baking, maybe try to bake with almond flour instead of regular flour. Add nuts to your yogurt. You can toast nuts and add them to salads. Make your own granola or a homemade trail mix. California uh, walnuts website has lots and lots of different recipe ideas too. All right, that's. So olive oil is the primary oil. And that's because it's a rich source of monounsaturated healthy fats, which help to decrease inflammation. Now, with olive oil, if you can afford it, I would suggest going to specialty stores like um, Olive and Miko in Collingwood. And the reason for that is they tell you exactly when that oil, when the olives were harvested, because you want to use the oil within the year of the harvest date. But not only that, it also gives you the polyphenol content. And for polyphenols, that's what's going to decrease that inflammation. So you want to make sure the polyphenol content is over 400. And unfortunately, when we go to the store and buy olive oil at the store, that information is not on the label. All right, alcohol. Our last brain healthy food group, alcohol. Wine more specifically. I say this with a caveat. If you don't drink, I would not recommend starting. <laughs> right, we got that on video. <laughs> also, please speak with your doctor and or pharmacist as there are certain health conditions or medications where alcohol is contraindicated. The Mind Diet does recommend one five ounce glass of wine daily. Just as a reminder, when we go to the restaurant, we're usually served six or nine ounces. So it's much more than the five. So just keep that in mind. Because low levels of alcohol are thought to have anti-inflammatory effects on the brain, but too much can damage the brain. So we talked about the 10 brain healthy food groups. Now we're going to talk about the five less healthy food groups. So red meats and products try to eat them rarely. And that's because of the saturated fat. So you'll see that all of these foods are high in saturated fat, and the mind diet really encourages a decrease in saturated fat. So trying to decrease intake of fried and fast foods, less than one serving per week. Um, butter is recommended to decrease. There's a question about uh, margarine. Yes, margarine would have less saturated fat, but in terms of fat, I would always encourage olive oil versus butter or margarine. Um, and when we were talking about the Mediterranean diet, so if you go to Italy, they don't put butter or margarine on their toast. They dip their toast in olive oil and balsamic vinegar and different herbs and spices. I would encourage you to do that. So some resources. Um, so the first one there is just the United States Environmental Protection Agency, if you wanted to um, look at the mercury in fish, that's the infographic there. And then the other three, Ontario beans, lentils, and pulses, they have amazing recipes for anything to do with beans and lentils. Um, and again, if you're watching your grocery bill, that would be a really good strategy. Other resources is, that, as I mentioned, half your plate. Um, a lot of the resources I brought here with me are from that website. Um, Produce for Better Health Foundation, that's the website that has a database of different fruits and vegetables. So if there's a produce that you are not familiar with, you can go on there and it will tell you how to select 
store it, give you some nutritional information and recipes as well. And the last one there is Brain Health Food Guide. So that, um, I also have a hard copy here. And you will notice that there is a little bit of discrepancy between what I presented to you today and the Mind Guide. And it's not because I have outdated information, it's just there's so many um, nuances to it. And look, I wouldn't focus on the details, it's more about the big picture, right? And you will see the big picture is the same. Leafy greens, berries, decreasing saturated fat. So to summarize, nutrition is one modifiable risk factor for dementia. And following the MIND diet is one helpful approach. Try to avoid huge diet overhaul, but instead I would recommend choosing one or two changes to add to your routine until that becomes a habit. Then you can try another one or two changes. This makes the changes more manageable and sets you up for success so that it is sustainable, not a one month or a two month diet. Because remember, nutrition has to be consistent and sustainable to make an impact on brain health. It's not something that you follow for a short period of time. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any other questions, I'll